Hi, um, I'm Jennifer Michael Hecht, and I've written on a bunch of different subjects. One of my books is called The Happiness Myth. And I wrote this book because I found that as a historian, I was less worried about some of the things that my friends were worried about. Sometimes I was still worried about them, but in a different way. And I found that the things that upset them the most, in many cases, weren't upsetting me in the same way. And I came to understand this as happiness through historical perspective. And that's what the happiness myth is really about. It, in a way, it's a sort of anthropology of us, how we think of the way that we live our lives now and the ideals we have as, uh, as if they're really the best ideals, instead of seeing them in a long continuum of lots of different ways of living. And um, it's a sort of temporal prejudice. We think we're doing everything right just because we could go to the moon and the people in the past couldn't. But it's not really like that. Um, so. What are the kinds of things I'm talking about? Well, one of the things that be, some of the things that people worry about are how clean their house is, how often they're going to the gym, um, how much they work, whether they're working enough towards their goals. Well, let's just take a couple of examples. Think of the, uh, the vacuum. Before the vacuum was invented, just about a century ago, nobody had wall-to-wall -wall rugs, so nobody had to vacuum all the time. We just didn't put in wall-to-wall -wall rugs. How are you going to clean them? And indeed, even the small rugs, we beat them outside. They got kind of clean. We did it every once in a while. If you had servants, you did it a little more often. But everybody's house was less clean. You invent the vacuum, it's going to make everything easier. Suddenly, everybody's got a vacuum. Um, take another example. Uh, caffeine. Throughout history, we have thought of tea and coffee as relaxation drugs. Uh, think of the cultures. That have, that have had tea for the longest time, and you're, you're thinking about Jap Japan, think about uh, the United Kingdom, think about England, and they've created these tea ceremonies around which you relax, you socialize, you do all these things that take time and patience. We have set up our coffee experience in a very different way because of our obsession with productivity. Even in our culture, just 50 years ago, a coffee break. You thought of coffee as something you did to stop working. You would go to a diner, and a nice person would come over and refill your very small, mild cup of coffee, right? It was a paternal experience, a, a kindness, a relaxation. Now we've set up our coffee shops like assembly lines, right? Everybody in the coffee shop is working. They're either at their laptop or if they're minding their kid, they're got, they've got their kids there, they're watching their kids. Everybody's working. It's, we've, we've looked at a drug that has always been thought of as a relaxation and stimulation, and we've turned it into just stimulation, and we drink our coffee while we work. Gyms are another really interesting one. There's really nothing that associates a gym body. Exercise is good. You walk, you rake your leaves, you clean your house. Exercise is good. You play. But the, the gym body, there's nothing that associates a gym body with extra health. So look at the cultures in the past that have had a cult of the physical body in the way that we do today. You can find the ancient Spartans. You can find the, uh, the fascist regimes of the last century. And to some degree, you can find the uh, plantation, southern plantation cultures of, of several centuries ago. In all these cultures, there's an underclass that does the work. The Spartans had a group of slaves, the Kila, who were a larger population than their own. So all the work, the sweaty work, was put on this lower class. As we have a sort of lower class with immigrants and teenagers, and other people who, for, for whatever reason, we think of as the ones who are supposed to be doing the sweaty labor. So we pay them to rake our leaves, and we pay them to clean our house, and then we take the escalator to the stairmaster. We keep our sweaty clothes in a separate container, right? These are my gym clothes. We go to work clean. We come home clean. All these are symbolic gestures. When we see it in ancient Sparta and with the fascists, we understand that the exercise that the upper class is doing is a militaristic gesture. That the cult of the body as a muscular thing is a militaristic gesture. We see it, it's in every history book that looks at those things. Well, what are we doing? 
We don't see it as a militaristic gesture, right? But when we look at other cultures, we can. That doesn't mean don't go to the gym. If you like the gym, go. But if you don't like the gym, that place is not what it says it is. If you look historically, you don't find places like this throughout most of history. And instead, you can choose to do your own kinds of chores to whatever degree you don't mind, but to remember that these class meanings are imposing ideas on us. We can, we can pick and choose. You don't have to reject your culture, but history lets you choose a little bit. Going through history, I found that there were three major kinds of happiness. There's good day happiness, good life happiness, and euphoria. Our culture is a little bit obsessed with good life happiness. All our advice, all our, the, our ads, our advice, our experts are always telling us how to do things to have an overall good life. The problem is that good day happiness, good life happiness, and euphoria actually don't always go together. You have to get a balance. You have to remember these three. Look, if you want a good life, you've got to study a lot. You've got to work hard. You've got to clean a lot, right? You've got you to think and plan and work. If you did that every day, you would forget the joy of, the regular, of, of, a, of an easy day, of, of a movie, of hanging around. Euphoria. You don't need much euphoria in life. One or two euphoric experiences, or three or four, can get people through a lot, of, a lot of existence. We don't need that many, but you need some. Now, going to an outdoor concert that, of music that you love and hanging around with friends, that can sometimes lead to a euphoric experience, especially if there's dance involved. Um, why don't we do it all the time? We don't do it all the time because there are problems with it. First, you've got to find parking. You've got to get the tickets. It's a pain. And if you do it the way many of us do it, a little extra drinking maybe, the next day doesn't feel so great. But over the course of a lifetime, you have to go out of your way to get a little euphoria now and again. And you have to forgive yourself for some days instead of cooking, you know, steaming some trout and sitting at the table with your family, you know, getting a bucket of chicken and sitting in front of the television with your family. The point is that we allow experts to tell us we're wrong, even though we vote with how we live all the time. We don't do the things that the experts say, and then we think, ah, oh, I, I failed. Maybe the experts failed by being too obsessed with one particular type of happiness when we know that a good day is required to even have a good life. But if you become obsessed with just productivity, with just the overall good life, you'll forget that. And if you forget to think about euphoria, to introduce some of these kinds of peak experiences into your life, go climb the mountain. Go do the special thing. Go allow yourself to have some of these larger experiences that take some planning and sometimes, you know, sometimes take a little while to get over or to get out of, given whatever kind of situation. The point is, history can allow you, and this is what the happiness myth, the book I, I, I wrote is all about, these different kinds of ways, thinking about drugs and sex and work and, and all sorts of our habits, in terms of the historical, allows us to see who we are and to make some choices. I thought I'd end with a poem of mine um, called History, uh, which I think has this kind of ability to remind us of um, how a little distance can sometimes make all the difference. Um, it's short. History. Even Eve, the only soul in all of time to never have to wait for love, must have leaned some sleepless nights alone against the garden wall and wailed cold stupefied and wild and wished to trade in all of Eden to have but been a child. In fact, I gather that is why she leapt and fell from grace, that she might have a story of herself to tell in some other place.